I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, Darren Green. Sorry. Darren Green. Darren Green? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Darren. This is Laura Schmidt. She'll be right back. Okay, awesome. Um, we'll wait until uh, back then. I think before we have eight people sign up for this, but honestly, a few of my students signed up for this uh, session by mistake. Um, so I won't be offended if you decide to walk out. <laughs> this is primarily aimed at uh, low resource teams with perpetual rookie syndrome or rookie teams that are looking to break into the field of robotics. Uh, I am by no means the definitive expert. I just have been a rookie a lot with various teams. Uh, come on in, guys. Would you like to join us? So just a brief introduction about myself. I am a teacher at Columbia International College. I teach EJ3M, which is the computer engineering the, uh, uh, specificity on robotics. Uh, I also teach the 4M and 2O equivalents, so grade 10 and 12, uh, starting next semester. I have a background in engineering robotics in Fanshawe College. Uh, this is my 12th season now with FRC that we're just starting up. Uh, so I've been doing this since 2011, 2012. Um, so all the robots that are in the hallway, I have seen at competition, and they are as impressive as they look. Um, I spent uh, five years as an FRC student, I joined in grade eight, and so I've been on two different teams as a student, 13 teams as a mentor, and five first teams as a head coach. Uh, I've created several first teams and first mentorship clubs at various levels of the program. I started up the lead first mentorship club, which is Western Engineering at Western University. And I also started up the Fanshawe College Mentorship Club, both in the same city. Uh, so I, I've been trying to gain the skills to systemically create success within the community I was living in. I was living in London, now I've moved to Hamilton, so I'm hoping to do the same thing here. Uh, so far, I've helped FRC rookies earn 31 awards in FRC. Um, this sounds like a lot until you realize that I mentored like 10 teams last year. Um, so it's, it's an intimidating number. I need to be as approachable as possible with this presentation, and we have mostly a roundtable discussion on how to increase the resources for FRC teams. Very similar to one that just occurred in this room 10 minutes ago. Um, I'm currently mentoring five teams, 4617, the all-girls team, uh, John from London, Ontario, 5036, the Robo Devils from Scarborough, 5406, Celtex from Hamilton, uh, 6135, Arctos from Toronto, and Critical Circuits, who got their team number yesterday, we are team 9062. So our agenda today, we're going to go over the timeline of events, or at least the way that I like to order things during the season, appropriate goals, avoiding scope creep, um, recruitment, funding, training, design considerations, and then we'll do some resources and Q&A at the end. Welcome. So as we're going through the timeline, I'm going to give you guys a brief description of how I like to organize stuff. I will say this several times throughout this presentation. Every team is different. We have hundreds of ways of running a team, even just in Ontario, because there are hundreds of teams in Ontario. Um, so the idea here is to just sort of give you a general idea of how to stay on top and on track of certain things. So in September, or at the beginning of whatever school year you are, August for CIC, um, we like to start with recruitment and setting goals for the season. Making sure that you set appropriate goals means that your team isn't striving for Einstein when you're a pre rookie team still learning how the electronic system works. Assessing team capabilities. This typically includes fundraising and outreach component to try and increase your resources before you estimate how far to stretch those goals. October, training new members, grant application, selecting leadership and event preferences. So we'll start off with first one, training team members. Um, what I'm doing on October 6th is I am conjoining two of the teams that I'm mentoring with uh, CAD sessions. So 5036, 9062, we're going to learn over Zoom how we CAD on Onshape together. So that if we have any questions, we can ask both teams, and whoever is the best at CAD will be able to shine that day when they answer all the questions. Grant applications. I typically like to get them in by October. Some of them are due in October, some of them are due in February. Most of them are open during the month of October, so you can apply to just about all of them available. I know that there is an Argosy routine grant specifically aimed at rookie teams, uh, which my team has applied for. We've also got uh, the First Canada rookie grant, um, which I'm not even certain if you have to apply for. I believe that is 
Uh, it's currently organized by uh, Mr. Hodden. And um, there are other grants like the Arts Club Middle School FASCO uh, sponsorship. So all of these are good things to keep in mind. I'm not an expert on grant applications as the majority of the things I brought have been community-based, so we weren't eligible for most. Selecting leadership. If you're a rookie team, you want to do this after about a month or two of being in a club and seeing who's showing up the most. You want to make sure that the dedicated people are rewarded for how much they show up and how much they accomplish. With my particular team, 9062, um, we have uh, five, sorry, six people on the leadership team. We have it organized by automation, mechanical, partnerships, and strategy. So rather than having coding and electrical be separate individual segmented thoughts, it's usually the same guy who troubleshoots the code as the same guy who troubleshoots the wiring. Usually it's that one super dedicated uh, member, always in the back corner of the room, uh, with the hoodie tucked up and coding. Letting them get their hands on Worldlock for electrical allows them to see the way that it's uh, going to be programmed in the future. So switching that thing around, usually teams have an electrical department and a coding Can you department. Say those four or eight areas again? Yeah, sure. Automation, so that includes everything to do with the electronics. Yeah. Mechanical, which includes design and manufacturing. Partnerships, which is business as well as awards as well as outreach, because that's what partnerships are. Whether you're receiving something or whether you're giving something, it almost doesn't matter. Partnerships is dealt with the same way. I find a lot of teams they organize it so that you've got an awards committee or an awards group that focuses on applications of here's what we've accomplished, here's how we can get an award for it, and. While that is sustainable and does create success, it doesn't create equity in the first group because you've got one group of your team who is saying, here's what we've accomplished, and you've got one group trying to accomplish it. If it's the same people that are motivated to be their own success and to set appropriate goals. So after you've selected leadership, usually that comes after you've assessed your settings. I suppose I should go into how to select leaders, um, but I can deal with that in a couple of slides. Event preferences. Event preferences closed for your first event uh, two days ago, so uh, as of September 29th. Most teams in Ontario know what event they're going to as a first preference. Next week, I believe October 10th, is when you can select your second event in order of preference. Uh, the thing that I always tell the teams is apply for exactly one home event, <laughs> make that your first priority of your first pick. The second event is a separate system. The way that first does it is if you only put down one team, they will do their absolute best to make sure you, you go to that one competition. If on your next preference you put down four, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, we'd like to go to Newmarket, but our second priority is McMaster, then they will view that as somewhat equal. <laughs> You'll probably end up at McMaster. So after you filled in your event preferences comes November, there's off-season events in Hamilton and Windsor this time of year. Uh, November 6th, I believe, is the Southwest International Competition. October 29th or 30th is Stanley Cup and Overtime Sunday, uh, respectively. So those are great events for pre-rookie or low-resource teams to dip their toes into what is first and how to compete. Um, I know with Stanley Cup and Overtime Sunday, they actually loan out robots from the host teams so that every team has a chance to compete, even if you never competed in the actual season. So that's what my team's doing. Um, we're, we actually get to borrow uh, 5406's competition a lot this year, so we're quite enthused at that. Uh, and my team selected it because it was the coolest climber they had ever seen. So <laughs> we were really looking forward to getting our hands on it, learning how it works. After that comes, of course, paying the first fees. This year it is $8,800 Canadian to register for two competitions and receive three totes worth of stuff. It's about this big, fairly bountiful yield. However, a lot of the teams have um, those parts already in stock if they are no longer rookie. So you can opt out of some parts there and gain um, essentially coupons to redeem at first vendors. Paying the first fees becomes a lot more manageable if we follow the steps in September and October, making those connections and treating partnerships as a systemic thing rather than we need to find funding and separately we need to do outreach. Outreach leads to funding. So if you do more outreach, you're more likely to meet more people. And by meeting more people, you are more likely to succeed in fundraising because now you have connections. 
time we've made the first piece, finalizing the team branding, what do you want to present when you see a team for the first time? What is an image that pops in your mind? I'm going to use 2056 as an example, because you're the only team wearing team shirts here. Um, when you see the red gear, you automatically think of mechanical teams. You automatically think, oh, this is a mechanically competent team. The branding is extremely specific to that one team code. Columbia International College, you're wearing your uniform right now. When you see the logo, what do you think? Other than, oh my gosh, there's homework in school. <laughs> <laughs> you think of professionalness, right? We're wearing our uniforms. Figuring out what your team branding is, is sort of like figuring out what personality your team's going to have. So if you've got a lot of mechanically competent team members, branding yourself as a mechanically competent team, like 2056, is an excellent thing. Interteam collaboration, I put this in November, but it's year-round. The way that I run it is year-round, but November is where we do the majority of it, because that's when you have the most time when you're not doing registered things that you have to get done. November is the time when you do training, uh, leading up and paying off from October, and you also get to collaborate with other teams in the preseason. So that might be a hackathon, a stemathon, some sort of catathon, anything with an athon at the end. Um, making sure that everybody's on the same page before December and January. December, I like to keep things a little bit slower because a lot of people go on vacation. Uh, so doing inventory checks, ordering parts that you absolutely know we're gonna need and they finally have in stock. Building practice mechanisms for assembly so that we can prototype quicker, prototype faster. Anyone who attended the first session on prototyping the win by Brennan Simon knows that building modular practice mechanisms extremely effective way of managing your resources. You're not spending extra money, you have something that clicks together or unclicks, so you can use it separately. In January, of course, we have kickoff. Uh, this year is going to be January 7th, 2023. Um, I like to do what's known as a quick build, or an RA3D, or both. Quick build is where you have officially registered FRC teams open up their kit take stock and inventory, write down what they have, and then build the kit of parts. So assuming that they opted in for the drive base, you have a drive base of this big in a box, and you have all day to assemble it. As long as you don't modify any of the dimensions, you are given a robot that is miles too big for the 120-inch uh, frame room, which has been maintained since, I believe, 2018. So every year, that's the same rules. You can't have more than a 10-foot perimeter on your robot. So, with that in mind, we can assemble this day one, and then unbolt four bolts on each end, cut it to width on day two, once we've determined our design for the year. So during quick builds, the students who are on automation, they program in teleop mode, a basic auton mode, and they make sure everything's wired. Wiring's gotten a lot simpler in the past five years. I did a session with William at Studio Tech when we went over the electronic system. I can answer questions on that as well. After you've done the quick build, sometimes the mentors go off and do their own RA3D. I like to do that with alumni mentors who are considering coming back to mentor because it's fun, it's an engaging way to learn the rules, and it motivates people to come back and volunteer. After the RA3D is done, you take a look at every RA3D in the world, because they all release their videos on like the Monday or Tuesday after kickoff, and your team gets to decide on the design. I like to have the design configured, you know, the, the main concepts, how many intakes do we want, do we want a swerve, do we want a turret, do we want a climber, do we want an every bot? All those sort of big ticket ideas need to be finalized within the first three or four weeks. That way we're not arguing over, are we going to do tank or are we going to do swerve? Three weeks into the <laughs> Figuring it out day one is important. After that, cardboard prototyping fastest and the cheapest way to prototype without spending significant money or time finding the resources for it. Everything that we order comes with a nice handy cardboard box. Hold it down, figure out a small scale or a two scale model of what kind of mechanism are you thinking of? If you're trying to create a launch curve for this ball around this, uh, this turret here, how are we going to get it from the sequencer in the bottom all the way up to where the turret is? Figuring out those basic geometries using cardboard is incredibly fast and incredibly easy to put together. You can get no coolers to help out if you need it. After we prototype, comes building and programming. I don't need to go over that. Most people in the room are not rookies. 
Um, building and programming, uh, that happens continuously, usually in separate sections of the room. Hopefully this year I can figure out a way to get them working on the same robot at the same time, but uh, it's helpful if you have electronics elsewhere, because hand in hand make light work, as William said previously. After we program the competition robot, we have the final one to prepare awards if we haven't done it earlier. So if you're applying for chairman or entrepreneurship or something regarding a business plan, you want to make sure that absolutely it's done by January. Hopefully it doesn't go into uh, the January and February bill season, but hey, things happen. So what is the process in that? I'm not familiar with that. Is that like an application or are you just getting your ducks in a row so that you're eligible? In the so getting your ducks in a row so you're eligible for things is, is nice. It's not really something that you can intend to do. All the things that require an application require a formal application. Okay. All the things that are not requiring an application are decided at the competition. Okay. So it's all the interactions up between the judges and first volunteers versus your student standards. And all those are in the rules manual. So I, I'm assuming that you see, I saw the awards section there. Yeah, there's, there's an awards section on the basic rundown of rules. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. The chairman's award is not something that rookies or second years are eligible for. Traditionally, I have seen the second year team win it, but that's just an extended circumstance. Um, usually it's for teams with three to five years of experience minimum. Um, I applied once when I high school had five good years in a row, and we were quite successful with it. The entrepreneurship award is almost exclusively on the business plan and what you intend to do with the finances. Um, my team is hoping to apply for it next year. Again, it's usually a second or third year team thing. My business team is quite strong. We have the partnerships group, so we've got a 45 page business plan ready to go two months in. Um, are there exemplars like online people can find? There are, and as soon as I get the school board to approve my uh, business plan, I will make it public mm -hmm. through William Neal and the rest of the mobile alumni group to any team that needs it at the end of the region. Um, one of the benefits of running your own team is that you get to make it open source as much as possible and help others. Um, so after you've prepared these awards, you've figured out who your dean's lister is. I, by the way, that's another thing. Uh, grade 11, 10 or 11, uh, who's contributed the most on your team, sort of the, the MVP. You can nominate them for the dean's list award. They do an interview at the competition. If they do well enough, they individually get to go to provincial champs, whether you make it or not. Sometimes, like 3161 last year, your team member gets invited to Worlds and you don't. Uh, quite well, actually. He did quite well in his interview at Worlds. So he got to go to Worlds and participate oh, in Worlds. Solo. Just solo. <laughs> That's a great 11. It was yeah. a little bit scary for him, but he did quite well. Um, so yeah, the, the idea behind that and the Woody Flowers finalist award is to nominate people who have gone above and beyond on your team. Woody Flowers is for mentors. So if you're a one mentor team, it's kind of obvious who gets nominated if you get around to it. If you're a two uh, mentor team or more, um, it's nice to have it be a surprise. So I, I told my students, it's, it's okay if you don't apply. If you do apply, I don't want to know. <laughs> they submit an uh, essay and you get your name called and you get to uh, run down to the field for a few moments at each competition you're nominated for. So it's a nice thing. Um, so those are the other awards you have to apply for. Um, Awards like autonomous mode are sort of decided at the competition based off of robot performance. And I'm not the person asking this room, that'd be called 2056 folks. <laughs> February, dry practice. Um, a good model is to pretend like you only have three weeks to build a robot and then use the rest for practice and fine tuning. Um, so again, I like to have all my decisions made week one. I like to do the majority of the fabrication week two, two and a half. Week three, coding and electrical. And then week four, five, and six, we practice. It never goes that smoothly, but that's the plan. So usually it's off track by a week or two, but it still keeps us relatively under budget on time. Because instead of having a six week build season where we end February 27th every year in previous seasons, 2016 was quite a hectic rush, um, we then have an eight or nine week build season if you're Waterloo Day 1, not Day 1, Waterloo Number 1 competition this year is the one that we're officially registered for. It is March, middle of March or somewhere, just after March break. 
So we have all the way until mid-March to complete the robot practice. But by going off of the three-week model, it means that we've got plenty of time for mistakes, plenty of time for learn learning moments, teachable moments, and plenty of time to recover and fine-tune the robot. Iterations of mechanisms is key. Uh, Celtex is a great example of this. They iterated their intakes seven times this year. They built seven intakes. And each one was more efficient than the last. Except for version six, it was actually a downgrade from version five, which led to version seven. <laughs> uh, they were practicing and trying to figure out how to get the balls that are stuck in the corners of the field. Balls that sort of dribble there and don't move for the rest of the match because everyone else has a rigid intake. So they designed a slightly floppy intake out of wet sand that also had omni wheels closest to the edge, which omni wheels allow for vectors left and right, but always have a continuous vector of intake or outtake. It ended up being incredibly efficient, but they didn't think about that at the first meeting. They thought about Neckman Wheel, which had a positional vector at a 45 degree angle. So it was because of iterations that they were able to upgrade and then do well at the lottery competition. Upgrading the auto mode. I can't stress this enough as a low resource team, make sure you have an auto mode. Don't just abandon it and wait till the end. Uh, I've seen so many teams that are like, we can sit there for 15 seconds. No, I don't, and I don't that's like it. <laughs> I don't like giving my face controllers until I get auto mode. Totally fine. Yeah, auto mode is necessary. Uh, even just moving gets you points. Every year, moving off of a, a target line gets you points. Uh, and that's the absolute least that you can do to earn points. So even if you're a drive train, even if you only have to hit a target and no other resources, you can achieve those points every year. I don't know what the, the game is. I don't pretend to have insider info, but the last six or seven years, it's all been the same. There's an auto mode, you have to move off of a certain target line to earn points. Preparing the drive team, I've already figured out who the, who the drive team is for my pre-record team for STEM week, because that's this month. But traditionally, in February, once the robot's done and you're practicing, that's when you have drive trials. That's when you time each person and, based off of nothing but the footage, ignoring who's actually driving, select the footage, and then figure out, okay, who's the driver when we film that? That was a really good run. It's all by a set of equations. Uh, and this is something that Arctos actually taught me this year. Um, they're a great team when it comes to student leadership and figuring out who the drive team is completely blind of any biases is the most inclusive way to produce an effective drive team. Finalizing controls. Once you know what the drive team is like, you can ask them, hey, what's your favorite controller? How do you like the controls that you map? Do you like arcade drive? Do you like tank drive? Do you like Forza Drive? Nobody likes Forza Drive. Do I assume you're not asking, you're just talking to each other at this point? Usually it's the automation head who's then programming the controller. Uh, the teacher isn't usually involved in that process. It's uh, okay, what controller do I need to make sure is in stock? <laughs> or what controller do we have? And then pick between, figure it out. I've got, I'm, I'm lucky, I've got uh, a bunch of controllers from uh, various systems growing up, so I brought them all into my classroom and the students can pick. So we've got uh, classic NES controllers all the way up to PS2, PS4, Switch Pro controllers. Um, and yeah, let it rip, figure out which ones work, which one feels the most comfortable in hand, which one has the button maps you want. And that's an effective way to upgrade your programming without really doing anything to the programming itself. The comfortability of the driver should come first when it comes to driving. Anyway, going into March, we've got the competition season. Scouting and repairs and robot maintenance. Scouting is easy to do at a basic level. It's hard to do at an advanced level. The advanced levels are already here. Again, Celtex, 156, 1114. They all have their own scouting system. I use Blue Alliance, and I just memorize everything. Um, because I'm used to being the only person who talks strategy on us, specifically when I was a student. So with low resource teams, you have to be able to communicate effectively your scouting strategies, your playbook of sorts. So if you're organized enough, make playbooks of what you can do. Here are our, our auto modes with a map of the field and how we move. Here's what clearances we need on what things. Here's how we set up on the field. Is that compatible with you or do we need to change something? That is That goes miles for working with other teams. Teams will love you if you have a playbook. Because <laughs> then you're willing to work cooperatively. When it comes to actually analyzing the data, the Blue Alliance has come a long way in the last 10 years, and it is the number one resource for scouting. I don't know if you 
tell about the blue one? I come from the next world, and so my son was just seven. There's, there's a centralized website um, where they post match videos and for FRP, for FRP, for FRP okay. sorry, Blue Alliance. Um, who here hasn't, is not familiar with Blue Alliance? Is anyone not familiar with Blue Alliance? Two hands, okay. I talked to you guys about it in class, right? So, okay, so bluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliancebluealliance
So anyways, after we get to April, further iterations as the game meta changes. This is important. So if you have a defense blocker in week one, you're not going to do very well because nobody can score really well. If you have a defense blocker in a week six competition, everyone suddenly has a higher scoring gap because they've all iterated their scoring mechanism. So having a good defense robot in week six is far more manageable to have success with, far more successful than having a week one defense robot. Week one, I would recommend a climber or an end game mechanism of some kind. There's about every year there's an end game, and that isn't high demand at a week one event. Week six, high demand is good drive training. Doesn't matter what your robot can do. If you're a good driver, you can play defense. In May, conclusion of the season, sponsor thank yous and lessons learned. This is the recap. This is where we take all this information from the previous eight to 10 months and we consolidate it into a document. Things that we need to change for next year, action items, things that we need to prep over the summer, outreach opportunities that we've discovered through various partnerships. This is the culmination. This is the Avengers Endgame of yeah. our season. Yeah. Appropriate goal setting. It's important to accurately determine your team's capabilities and resources early on in the season as possible. We've already been over this. How many, how many mentors will you have? If you have one mentor, you should not be aiming to build this robot in the corner. <laughs> that has about 26 different sensors and motors and actuators on it. You've got one mentor who can troubleshoot and inspect the robot. Maybe you go for something a little bit simpler, like a climber and a low intake as opposed to an elevator intake and swing. How many dedicated students will be present? Not how many sign-ups do we have, how many people actually attend the meetings. If you've only got 20 people who attend the meetings, but on paper you've got 80 members, you don't say you have 80 members. You say you have 80 people in the club and 20 people on the team. That way you can dedicate those people and reward dedication. How well do you hope to accomplish? If you just want to make it through the season, that has a different set of circumstances than you want to make Einstein. How well do you want to compete merges into documentation. When you're building a business plan, you want to estimate how well you want to do. That gives your sponsors a confirmed goal that you're reaching towards and a plan of how to achieve that. They will love that stuff. Sponsors will eat that up. By adding a section for team goals in your business plan or other official documentation, you can track your progress and avoid scope creep. Does anyone know what scope creep means? <laughs> Are you aware of scope creep? No. We started as big as possible scope, so we never crept. Never crept. <laughs> <laughs> scope creep is whether your ideas get too big or your time runs short. One of the two occurs and you are left with not enough time for too many things. And that happens on almost every project in the world ever. One way of, sorry for using your picture by the way guys. Uh, one way of avoiding scope creep is um, by setting deliverables on a timeline specific to each subject. So automation, what do you want to accomplish this season based off of what we have? Well, we need a color sensor for the red ball and the blue ball to be able to determine which one to spit out and which one to throw accurately. That's fantastic. That's something that we can objectify, say this is a quantifiable thing we want to reach. We can accurately plan and then decisively choose week one of build two sensors. We can plan for we want to implement two sensors, and then we can decisively choose which two sensors. How are they going to be implemented? Are they going to be on a moving part of the robot, or is it going to be mounted to the chassis? That makes things a lot easier. If you've got a gyro and it's mounted to the intake, that's not a gyro. That's a random number generator. <laughs> <laughs> Scope creep can be waffling over what drive train to use, making two or three different mechanisms to see what works in a long timeline, or just not making a decision fast enough. Leaving no time for programmers to tune the robot controls. I don't know how to more further pronounce that that is a big issue. Um, I've seen lots of teams who go, we haven't turned on the robot since we built it. This is a week four competition, how do you make it this far? Yeah, we just finished building it. Programmers are coding it now, we'll see if it works. No, please don't. <laughs> Let's try and make sure that the goals are far enough ahead that we can have the automation department do something, build a tally up, build an auto mode, before mechanical goes, oh wait, we've got new iterations. Hang on a second. Let's have coding upload their code, test it to see if it works. If, you're, if it works nice enough, practice and see if drive controls make it better. These are all avoidable issues. When it comes to recruitment, you want to meet people where they are. Complete outreach in non-technical fields to find the people who aren't in tech yet. 
I don't understand why that has been a sticking point in the past. But somehow, a lot of teams get it in their head that we have to go and we have to do library STEM outreaches. We have to participate in every STEM-related thing in our entire city to gain new members. That's not gaining new members, that's taking members from other STEM-related activities. Meet people where they already are. Go to a knitting club, go to a, a, something about camping. Make a presentation there about green technology, about different segues that lead into automation and the STEAM sector. Meet people where they are, and maybe some will be convinced to help join you where you are. Building talent pipelines is along the same idea. We talked about it in the first session with Mr. Hunter, and we talked about it in the second session with Mr. Neal. We want to be able to build a talent pipeline from when a student decides they want to be into robotics to when a student doesn't decide to be in robotics anymore. So let's say a student goes, I want to learn more about tech, and they're in grade four. Great, well we've got first Lego League, We've got first Tech Challenge, we've got first FRC, the, the robotics competition. What comes after that? The alumni associations. There are three or four in Ontario that have started. I don't know whether they're coming back post-COVID or not. It sounds like Carlton's in. We'll see, we'll hope. <laughs> uh, we've had strong support in the past from alumni associations. These are the number one ways to gain new alumni mentors. People go to university after high school, so why not? Meet them where they are, and maybe convince them to join you where you are. Hello, William. Hi. William, meet William. Hi. Again, when it comes to recruitment, we want to invest in a dedicated. Great example, just walked in the door. William, I think you've messed with one meeting out of 35 that I've had for robotics. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you are our newest member on the board of directors for my team. You are rewarded for being dedicated and helping others. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, anytime. Here's a nice chart. It is a completely cost estimate based on my previous experience. When it comes to funding, you wanna make sure that you don't spend too much time to get too little funding. If we look at this, corporate is the largest part here. Corporate funding is something like applying for um, sponsorship at Honda, let's say. We go to a car manufacturer, we say, hey Honda, maybe you want to get in on this. We use sensors that you use on your cars, but we build it in six weeks. And then Honda goes, oh yeah, that's great, we'll give you two grand and a sensor. Have fun, good luck. And then you can plug them next year. And maybe you put in five hours to get that. And that ends up being a couple thousand dollars in your pocket that you can put towards registration. When you're a rookie team, you want to start with grants and public funding because rookie grants are the number one way to get funding as a rookie team. I'm a rookie team this year. I've been a rookie team like seven or eight times. Grants are the easiest way to get funding. Make sure you apply for grants. If you're not a rookie team, but you've got perpetual rookie syndrome, as I like to call it, you keep starting over and we don't know why, but we keep acting like we're rookies or we keep feeling like we're rookies when we're in competition. We can then look at this and go, okay, well we can't apply to the grants, but public funding might be more effective. We can reach out to people's parents. Everybody's got an uncle who has a business of some kind. Invite them out to a robot demo. Maybe they'll come up with resources or connections to then make these funding requests. Grants have a certain cap. Out of $10,000 worth of grants, you can't apply to anymore because some of them are mutually exclusive. And it takes too much time for you to apply for it. You spent 60 hours on it and gained $10,000. That's fantastic. But where do you go from there? You apply for corporate, public, or hybrid. Hybrid is sort of nonprofits, think tanks, stuff like that. They aren't known for having the most sustainable large amounts of funding, but it is a stable curve if you take a look at the graph. The more hours you put in, the more funding you will receive from that source. Various people, but still hybrid sources. So Rotary, Lions Club, um, the Kinsman Club, all of these sort of nonprofit service clubs are great resources to talk to because either they know a guy or they know a guy who knows a guy. Consider what type of team you are. If you're a community team, maybe you don't want to go for the grants that require you to be in a board. That's not getting anywhere. You want to apply uh, if you're an incubator or a school team, because then you have schools linked to you. You have evidence that you are going to create STEM curriculum in the future. Training. You gotta gauge interest and train students in what you know they'll want to do for build season and what you need them to do for build season. For example, William, what kind of climber did you make this year? Yeah, it's not very special. <laughs> not very special. 
Okay, but as a rookie, you built a chin-up mechanism from a climber and a kit. And that's important because now you know how to build a climber. So if you ever need to build another chin-up device, which goodness knows, every, every year with that fails, somebody needs to do a chin-up somewhere. Now we know how, and we have a resident expert that we can ask. Training people in what they're interested in, because William was there every day, in something that we know we're gonna need. These are all kinds of different things and how they split up automation mechanical partnership strategy. I already briefly went over that, so we're gonna gloss over this. Design considerations. Resources, skill level, scope, space, event choice. If you're going to Waterloo and Mac, and you're a local resource team, build a defense box. Mac and Waterloo are the two hardest events in Canada, and dare I say it, top 10 in North America. Mostly because everyone else in this room is going. <laughs> so when we consider our skill level, our scope, our event choice, we can create an effective resolution to the first challenge without having too many barriers. Some good examples of building within your means, 4814 from 2013 to 2014, they were top three most effective rookies of all time. They were a community team that acted as an incubator. From 2014 to 2019, they split up and formed seven other teams in the London, Ontario area. Many of those teams are still in operation today post-COVID, including 4617 and 5024. From 2013 to 2014, they built a robot that went undefeated as a rookie defense bot at Thierry Field in 2013 at a World Championship Series. In 2014, they played semifinals and lost to the folks in this room, <laughs> which is not all that uncommon in 2014, by the way. You guys sort of dominated everything in the GTR. Uh, we had to keep trying to go to further and further away competitions. <laughs> oh my gosh, 2056 is going, okay, we gotta move somewhere else. 6875 from 2018 to 2022. They had a wonderfully simple robot. They placed 14th at the World Championship Series uh, in Detroit in 2018. They also won the Provincial Championship Series uh, and the Windsor competition as well. 2019 and 2022, they also built robots with extremely effective climbers and abilities to do endgame. I'll, I'll, I'll leave for a second because they're, they're doing a little bit. All right, no worries. Uh, 40, 4903 and 610 in 2022 are the two most recent examples. So 610 built a kit bot and used it in competition, even though they're a really old team with one of the larger budgets in the region. They analyzed the resources and went, you know what, why are we building a custom drivetrain this year? We have like two weeks in session to build in person because of the COVID pandemic. What if we built a standard drivetrain and then just focus on the top half? And it worked out great. They won the provincial champ, or sorry, they were in the finals of the provincial champ. Top of my head, I can't remember if they won or not. The fact that they were able to be highly successful in the top six in Ontario is wonderful, given the fact that they were a kitbot. They were the only kitbot that made it that far. First senior mentors under resources are the number one resource I can recommend. Paul Keenan comes to mind, Phil from Risby is in this region. Uh, we've also got Sarah Sills, who runs um, sort of the Oakville region. Uh, we've got uh, Mrs. K, Ms. Kachelski, she runs uh, a lot of the stuff with interteam resources in Windsor. And we've also got Ms. Heather Kettle, so up north in North Bay. First senior mentors are sort of first Canada's first line of defense when it, that's a lot of first. First line of defense when it comes to questions from mentors and teams. After that, it goes to first Canada staff, such as William. I'm gonna reference you because you're here. So if Paul can't answer a question, he'll go, well, I don't know the answer to that, but maybe I can ask William and he can connect you and provide partnerships with the people who can answer these questions. The mobile alumni group, as referenced in the uh, second session, is another great resource. I'm one of the mobile alumni crew. I believe we have like four or five other alumni from across Ontario with access to vehicles and parts and equipment and knowledge. Just let us know, we'll do what we can. If we can't do it, we'll find somebody else who can. FRC teams with more seniority. A good example would be the hub teams. Those are another line of places you can go when you have questions or places you can go for reasons. If you can't make it to an FRC team with more seniority, if you're a remote team, let's say 6865 from uh, the Michigan area in uh, Manitoulin Island, they have to source their parts through a Home Depot that's like four hours away because they're so remote. So maybe you can't go to another FRC team for experience, but what you can do is you can go on Sheep Delta. It is like Reddit, but helpful for FRC. 
and you can post a question, and probably three or four big people from this picture can help you out. The Covalence Crew uh, Initiative, which is going to be hosted by CAC this year, is hoping to sort of take the same ideas from the first senior mentors and the mobile alumni crew, but apply it at the level of high school students. So rather than having alumni come and help your team, we're going to have teams helping other teams. We have the full weight of a 30-person team able to assist other teams because, oh yeah, we encountered that issue too. Yeah, the Andy Mark frame this year. Yeah, there, there was a weird issue with that nut setting. We need to torque that down and add some Loctite, and then it'll, it'll be good. That kind of knowledge isn't as easily accessible at the other levels because they answer the questions like, how do I find funding? How do I organize getting my kid across? The literal nuts and bolts, ask another team with seniority. Or you can contact me from my contact email at the bottom. Again, I don't know how you guys didn't get that email. It was available. It was available for years. I'm frcontario at gmail.com. So some Q&A. How do I make a business plan? Already asked. Great examples online. Team 1111, Powerbox from the States. They have one that I learned and built mine off of. 1305 in Canada. Probably the best business plan in all of Canada. Um, 4039, if you're looking for somebody local. And 2056 have both won chairman's recently. They are excellent resources to um, politely ask, hey, can we take a look at that business plan and see if we can model something similar? And as soon as I get my uh, public business plan approved by uh, my school admin, I will be making it public to any teams that ask for it. Uh, it's 45 pages, I apologize, it is a long read, but uh, it's incredibly thorough and you can take what you want and leave what you don't. How do I find parts in this electronic shortage? Which was another question that was raised in the first session today. Ask teams in your area. Check official resellers. So Student and Vexpro actually have motor control looking stuff that are out of stock at the original creators, Andy Mark and CTRE. So Vexpro and Studica, sometimes they have stuff that's out of stock or discontinued months after it's been out of stock or discontinued at the American resellers, just due to volume. In this case, you can't find a brushless motor controller anywhere that fits FRC. In fact, I brought four to this competition to loan to another team because they had zero. So that's why it looks suspicious when I'm carrying eight nice shiny red boxes out to another team's uh, trailer. Um, if you can't find it off of an official reseller, I, I am starting up a loaner parts program and I do have motor controllers, uh, brush and brushless, that I'm willing to loan out for the preseason. So until stuff comes back in stock, let me know. I am willing to help. I don't know what resources people need. Sometimes I don't know what resources I have. But the point of first is to create an open source competition. It's not closed source like Battlebox where you keep company secrets or something. We're all one team. Ontario is a team, Canada is a team, first global as a team. So I guess I'm gonna open it up whatever time we have left to questions and answers. Does anybody have any questions so far? Is there anything that I can connect you with? So as teachers, like when you set up your courses and you said you should take the dual course, would you do that first semester as opposed to second semester, like for prep time? The second semester feels like you're almost done by the time you were it. It's, it depends on the school. I was lucky with my semesters. Like, I, my second semester was January, April. So okay. it's a perfect map on that. Yeah, yeah I've, got, so I've got the exact same thing. I've got, January to April? Yeah. Yeah, I start okay. mine August to December, January to May. That's yeah, my so two semesters. Public board, so if I were in public February. board and I started in February, I'd have to start things in my class. Be careful around exams. That's all I'll, I'll yeah. say. It's yeah. smack dab yeah. in the middle of uh, bill season. The good news is the really smart kids, the really good kids that you got, the dedicated ones, they'll be like, oh yeah, I don't need to study for math, I already have a 98. Um, I'll just hang out immediately following that exam. And uh, I'm gonna ask her, are you in a class in this school that does robotics right now, or are you just in a class? Second semester. Second semester, are we in it? Okay, which one? Uh, computer engineering. Okay. I'm just mixed with the robotics person here. Okay, so that's the grade 10s? Uh, grade 12s. Grade 12s, okay. Cool. That's one of the challenges First of all, because you have to start in February, you're most of the way done with the cool stuff by yeah. February. And then it goes then, on into June. So yeah, there's competitions. And then yeah. if you have a semester that goes into June, I would really just hard to think about that time. If you have a finished robot, doing public uh, things is, is a must. In May, uh, we debuted this robot in the top corner. This robot is one eighth 
the volume of the robot on the bottom. And it was designed by six students in about four weeks at uh, CIC. It wasn't designed to be FRC legal, as you can tell from the uh, radio being on the outside of the frame, but it was designed to get them familiar with the electrical concepts so that we can upgrade the one on the bottom, uh, which was donated from 8320 when they closed, so that we can then upgrade that one, learn more, and be able to build essentially a practice bot in the pre-treat. So we really lucked out with this, but we debuted in May and did an outreach at our school where actually the Two girls standing in the corner got to be there and drive around. Oh, Shana, you drove the robot out of the channel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also drove a drone, and that generated interest. And that also led to new members coming in next year. So if you have spare time at the end of the season, that's the perfect thing to add in there is yeah. outreach, outreach, outreach. I did 100 outreach in a year. Don't do what I did, but like that really paid off. That was a lot of funding because everybody knew me. Um, everybody was able to go, oh yeah, you guys were at the you know, Delaware Speedway, or you were at the um, Tesla Electric City Festival, which is what Celtex did like two days ago. Um, being able to go to public events like the Dundas Parade would be an excellent way to get finished robots out and not necessarily build time, but find useful things for that time each year. So I guess one of the other questions that I have for everyone in this room is what resources are teams lacking? Because I know what my team is lacking. I know what the teams that I'm in contact with are lacking. What are your respective teams lacking? And maybe we'll go around this room. Do you mind if I start with you, Evan? I know one resource my team would lack is time. Time. Um, really? that's, that's one I can't lend. <laughs> realistically, and not hypothetically, but realistically, maybe six hours a week. Six hours a week to build season? Um, to throw to build season. Sure. And I just want to ask if it's if something like that is realistic. That, that's realistic if you want to go for an every box build, if you want to go for something that you've already seen. Every box from previous years, by the way, are often useful in the following year as well. Uh, 2018, every box design made it into 2022 in the States. Um, so taking previous designs, using them almost carbon copy, you can manage that in six hours a week if you've got really dedicated students. How many students are you expecting? I've got students, but the issue is that they have to be home by five o'clock. Um, and they implement twice a week, maybe. Um, I'm hoping for more, but realistically, that's what I'm anticipating. That's like, I don't want to- I think that's that. a, having a realistic expectation is first of all, a good first step. So there's a lot of teams that go, oh, we have what you're describing, but we're hoping for 40. So we'll plan for 40. No, plan, plan for what you have. Go, okay, realistically, we'll probably be copying this RI3D, not necessarily copying, but borrowing mechanism ideas and learning from them and then doing what they do. That's completely legal in the FRC state of things, although uh, in school that's considered plagiarism. Uh, <laughs> so um, when, when you're analyzing your resources, I think that's completely reasonable to build a robot on that, however. If you want to build one with, I'd say, primary and secondary objective capabilities, so whatever the end game is, plus whatever you do in the main portion of time, those are usually two separate things with two separate mechanisms. If you're hoping to do both, you need a lot more time or a lot more dedicated students and more mentors. You can throw money at the issue, but that doesn't necessarily change anything. It's the expertise to time ratio. When you're estimating your capabilities, you want to factor both in a mathematical equation of some kind. And I literally had a mathematical equation. I'm like, okay, here's how many dedicated students I have. You know, I have 20 students times four hours a week. I'm able to achieve 80, 80 hours of work out of those students, assuming we're focused 100% of the time. But you don't assume they're focused 100% of the time. You times it by 0 0.8 uh, because they're distracted 20% of the time. No offense. Uh, <laughs> Um, so by figuring out realistically how, how much work are we actually going to get out of this, we're going to get you know 60 to 75 hours of work a week out of these students because we have 20 showing up in four hours a week. So you, you organize as best you can. Let's say you have even distribution across all teams. You would be able to do and every box lesson upgrade five times a week, week three, week four competition. 
At least that's my estimate, right? I don't know your students. You might have all-star students and you're gonna be miles ahead of you by week 34. Or maybe you have students who are applying to other things or on student leadership and they aren't there as much as they say they are gonna be. At least that's what I get estimated. I literally plug in a math calculation to figure out how realistic am I being? Can you complete this? Can I complete it in that time? No, okay, then well they can. So what other resources do you need other than time? Because I'm afraid I can't change time. Um, for instance, we even have some adults that are willing to mentor, but the issue is that the kids go home. Before yeah, before the mentors even arrive. Yeah, that's an issue in the school board. Yeah, and to work later would be to prolong how long the rest of the support staff is there, and then suddenly you're out of pocket. Is it possible to organize like evening Zoom calls with some of the mentors? I know you can't manufacture, but uh, this year, because of the lockdown, one of the side effects is a lot of teams did a lot of thinking for the first three weeks and planning and designing, and when they actually did get to the mill, they were ready. Aquatics had eight days to build a robot. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that robot? It was pretty. It didn't move, <laughs> but it was pretty. <laughs> so it might be possible to say, okay, the programming team can meet with this mentor from seven to eight at night when they're already home. And so on the design team, maybe that can get a little bit more time out there. Our mentor chats with our students on the Discord during the day. Yeah, so I that. Yeah, Discord is a huge asset because, like, in my experience, the students who are on robotics, 100% of them have Discord. <laughs> like, in, in the public board at least, it's like 100%, 95% of them have Discord already because they're the ones who play Minecraft, they play Roblox, they're communicating with their friends already on it. They can invite their friends to your Discord and suddenly you have more people showing up. Um, it's a great way to increase your resources because suddenly you can borrow time from when they're at home doing nothing. At least in the public board. With the private board, everybody's back at residence and if we have 100 people join the Zoom call at residence, the residence Wi-Fi goes down. <laughs> so I guess I'll go to you guys. Um, you were considering starting an FRC team from an FTC team? I have an FTC team. They've never competed yet, but we're hopeful for this year. Okay. Um, and then in my FRC career. So I think I wouldn't jump into it this year, but maybe we'd shadow the game reveal and say, hey, if we were playing, yeah. and if, if the competition set might cost some. Yeah. Then, yeah, kind of field trip or something to bring them out. Um, there's also a competition at McMaster. So Are they all on Saturdays? Uh, it varies. Uh, There's usually Friday. one day that's a Saturday. Oh, yeah. um, whether that's the first Except day or the last Friday. day is yet to be determined. Um, I like what was, was Stan was mentioning before, it was like yeah. the, trips are like the one that I planned is Thursday. Thursday. Saturday is to say if you can make it there. Yeah. It's not a trip, it's just. It's yeah, just it's casual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. La last year it was one day. Yeah. We had to do one day events for COVID guidelines and regulations, uh, as set out by First International. However, after after like post COVID, we're, we're going to a two and a half day schedule where we load in on an afternoon or evening, and then we have two days of competition. And in the case of Waterloo, we have two events in a row. So that same evening that everyone's loading out, a new batch of teams is loading in. Some of them will be the same, some of them will be different. And then they do an, another two and a half days. Yeah. So there's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then there's a Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, for the first where they finish, yeah, for the first time, Monday evening at like seven to nine p.m. somewhere else. Really well. I'm used to this day on Monday. So. Yeah, the one day events. If you're a volunteer, the one day events are brutal. But if you are a competitor, the one day events are lovely and light, and you get to go home and sleep in your own bed. They're convenient. The two two and a half day events, they have their positives because you can actually do scouting. But well, one day events, you have to just go. Ah, these guys so are good. I guess we're used to the. I never saw them. Yeah, I, I used to be that guy. Yeah. Um, I can attest it's unsustainable for the students to do that two or three events in a year. Yeah. Um, one of my friends literally turned green in the face by the third competition because he's going, I have been up way longer than I should be, and I have had way more monsters than I legally should have. <laughs> <laughs> now, is CAD like a good uh, design device for FTC? CAD's good for everything. Okay. On Shape is fantastic. It has online resources specifically for FRC. I know they have tutorials catered towards people in first program. And um, FTC Simulator, do they also do design components? I'm not sure about that. I think it's 
I know it's good for coding. I've never agreed. You have to use the robot in here as far as I know. Well, between FTC Sim doing the digital program, the coding's amazing. The coding's yeah. fantastic. And yeah. then with Onshape, you can share files as they're being edited. So you can have three or four people editing it from different computers all around the world. And, and has someone made a standard library of like the parts that come in the box? Yeah, there are, there are libraries online. Okay. And um, every supplier also has, uh, at the bare minimum, PPS. Yeah, What's that called? On shape, you said? On shape, yes. Yeah. Um, there are free ads all the time. But, yeah, yeah, there are free student licenses. And. Um, That's the web based cat, right? Yeah, it's That's the web based. in front of all the first. There's two web based cats, there's also Fusion. Okay. Um, oh, I'm familiar with that one. I have that one next to it. Yeah, so Fusion is the one that schools tend to like yeah. because it's been the most even set the entire time while other cats have come and gone. Um, Fusion's been a steady uh, competitor. Uh, I'm not familiar with Fusion, but I do have a mentor who's familiar with uh, Fusion, and uh, he's been designing, we're actually doing a three pound battle bot in order to train the mentors um, on how to design yeah. stuff in Onshape and uh, Fusion. So that's been really helpful. Yeah, uh, Onshape is super easy to get into. There's tutorials online, and there's also a ton of parts libraries that are open to the public on the web browser. So you can, it, it's kind of like GrabCAD, and unfortunately GrabCAD's closing at the end of the year. But you can take designs online, download them, modify them, or even edit them in the cloud, and then suddenly you can publish them and help other teams. Um, and so using cloud or web-based CAD, you are suddenly able to increase the resources of everyone by sharing it publicly. So I recommend that. SolidWorks licenses are um, sponsored by the Salt Systems for FRC teams. So if you register, you would get 35 licenses or something like that. Um, but at this stage, if you're a low resource team, I wouldn't recommend SolidWorks. The built-in CAM functions of SolidWorks are good for if you have manufacturing capabilities. If you're in-house, like, uh, don't ask If I can get my tech guy, and he's, like, off on me, you know, but, like, I think he's totally capable of doing metal work. Do you have a metal shop there? Yeah, with, like, uh, oh, like a laser cutter and a whole bit. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's yeah. convenient. Okay. Then, absolutely. And the lathes and all the bits. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, that's a huge asset, and that will, in that math calculation, that increases your resources. Calculating, you know, what are your mechanical capabilities might be a separate math calculation as a multiplier of how much work can you actually get done. Because yeah. a drill with a Dremel bit is how you pretend to have a lathe if you don't have a lathe. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't recommend it, by the way. That's very unsafe, but uh, I have done it, and it, it does work technically. Um, yeah. So I mean, when it comes to when it comes to CAD, I upload everything to GrabCAD. I don't know what the sequel to GrabCAD is going to be, but I think it's either December or January, it's shutting down. Um, rumor is there's gonna be another company trying to buy it, but there's been no actual um, stories on that, so I can't officially say. Right now it's looking like a lot of the CAD that's been publicized, uh, 1114 and 118, two stellar teams, uh, one quite local in St. Catharines, they upload all their robots <laughs> every single <season. laughs> Governor Simpson. Okay. They upload their CAD files from every year to GrabCAD so that any team with any amount of resources can learn about how the robot works down to the nuts and bolts. And I think that's a great resource. I've been trying to do that with my teams in, in the past when I was the head coach of robotics. We did that with our entire robot in 2019 and 2020, I think. Um, one of the other mentors uploaded everything to GrabCAD, and, and that means that it's a cost design, so it means that you can reuse it year after year. Find a way to make it public, and you can re or reuse any design you make year after year. If you don't make it public, you can't reuse that cat body. You have to make a new one. It is, it is a matter of honor. It's not really a registered system or anything, but um, we can usually try. So yourself, I guess you have ex uh, several teams of uh, examples: Nancy Campbell and um, LIAs. Yeah. What do they need? What do they need? Yeah. Well, right now, um, Nancy Campbell is in a great shape. They have an excellent mentor from the Stratford Festival. Who's oh, okay. Got like fabrication. Uh, it's not just Purdue running that. Pardon? It's not just Purdue anymore. No, it it was not even last year. He helped them a lot. That's fantastic. So they had enough mentors. My son went there. They they got enough mentors. They. Yeah. 
Yeah, the students who showed up were extremely dedicated. I mean, I remember looking at those. They are, they are already meeting regularly this year. They didn't even meet awesome. at all until about like halfway through February last year. Wow, okay, quite impressive. Um, my other school is going to be, yeah, is a perpetual rookie center. Perpetual rookie center, yeah. Because they have a new mentor. Mm -hmm. so Switching and mentors. Students. Knowledge yeah. transfer is something I didn't actually mention. Yeah. No, knowledge transfer is important to keep in mind yeah. near the end of the season. You don't necessarily have to do it every month, but yeah. I have a board of directors meeting and we're setting it up for every Wednesday. Um, so that the student leads can communicate lessons learned from that week, goals for this week, yeah. what resources do we need, how do we get them, that stuff. And we iterate the entire management section of the team every time we meet. Mm -hmm. So last, I guess it was only four days ago, we added William as part of our board of directors because the mechanical uh, sub-team lead went, look, I've got 20 students who signed up for mechanical. I don't know a thing about teaching. I don't know how I'm going to keep up with this. So like, okay, who's the next most dedicated mechanical member? Oh, it's William. Oh, he's actually built stuff before. Let's get him in here and invite him to be part of the board of directors so that we can more equitably source resources. So yeah, sometimes it's perpetual rookie syndrome that gets you down. You have to make sure the knowledge transfer and the enthusiasm stay the same. That's true because almost all grade twelves. Yes. All, every year. It's yes. going to be like something like that all the time. I really lucked out. I've got a couple of I have got a large group of grade tens right now. Yeah. And that is a huge that challenge. Yeah. Huge I've got forty percent grade twelves. So I think they had a grade nine, ten, eleven, twelve in great balance. Mm -hmm. And they're returning members this year. Teachers returning. It it will be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the goal. These these private academies, they have the added they might not have as much fundraising they have to do, but it's more fundraising than you think. And they also have the added bonus of every two years one hundred percent new students. <laughs> so how do you train students for six months and have that many? ESL. ESL on top of that. International, boarding, private school. Yeah. They all board the same bus at the same time and nobody cleans up. <laughs> <laughs> They just go, oh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm cleaning up for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta time that in. Yeah. Oh, the later the step 